It's as if you take a map of Europe and this map is empty, you don't have any contact. So the European Theatre Network really helps you to have your entry door, to get to know other contexts, to get to know other organizations, and of course, to get to know other people in this theatre. For us, joining ETC was an obvious decision. Why? Because it's, it's Malta as is an if island, you take... but we don't want to think like an island, we want to be European, and the ETC gives us that opportunity. ATC did a lot for Ukrainian theatre area. We received a fantastic and unique, I think, possibilities to present yourself and your productions and to open Europe for Ukraine and uh, Ukraine for Europe. Besides uh, the opportunity to, to see different uh, festivals in different places around Europe, in the ETC meetings, we have uh, the wonderful uh, possibility to, to apply for artists uh, to go, for example, one week to Avignon, to the festival. And what I really like about this network is that it is mainly the artistic people that meet twice a year. So you really get to know each other, you build up trust to collaborate, and then you can really start collaboration projects. And that's what I really like about EDC. We organize each year for the opening of a season a picnic in the street, in front of a theatre. It has become a, an event in the city, and this is after a conference in uh, ETC about how to create links with, with uh, the audience and uh, with the city. What does it mean to be European today? What does it mean to make theatre in Europe today? Which productions are the relevant ones today? And I think we're stronger together when we discuss these things. So uh, the ETC is our natural home for internationalization. Welcome to the first virtual conference of the European Theatre Convention, Connecting the Separated. Welcome to our panel discussion, Reopening European Theatres. It's now June 2020. In most European countries, the first wave of COVID-19 has started to slow down, and every week politicians announce which parts of society are to resume next. Well, finally, theatre has also made it into the news. And I'm very happy that today we'll discuss how to ensure the continuity of our sector's activity, in particular, the international collaborations. Well, my name is Heidi Wiley, and I'm the Executive Director of the European Theatre Convention, Europe's Network for Theatres. And it's my pleasure hosting you this morning. Normally, we would be all sitting now in the Schauspielhaus Graz in Austria, and we would probably take our seats laughing and chatting with each other like you've seen in our video when we met last summer in Dresden. Well, that was before the pandemic. This time is different. Let me welcome you all very warmly here to our Zoom room. It's the first time that we are live streaming our panel discussion with an open access to the entire theater community around the world. So therefore, I very dearly welcome our ETC member colleagues and friends from around Europe. The many guests who have joined us for the first time, and also a warm hello to everyone who's following us on the live stream. And those of you who will watch this program maybe later online in the evening or in the following days and weeks to come. I'm sure most of you know by now very well the tips and tricks to network on Zoom. Well, you can use the chat option below at your screen to talk with each other or with the other participants and send questions later in the final question and answer session. As a start, you can tell us, for example, from where you're watching. I'm very thankful that we are able to offer this program and can give theatres in Europe the voice to be heard in this time of crisis, to address our challenges and also to discuss solutions for our sector to survive the pandemic. For the continuous support, and also the ongoing dialogue to make that happen, I really want to thank our strategic partner, the European Commission, and most particularly the Directorate General for Education and Culture, and Barbara Gessler, who is the head of the Creative Europe Programme. Well, let me now introduce you to Serge Rangoni, president of the ETC, 
and general and artistic director of Théâtre de Liège in Belgium. Hello, dear colleague and friends. In uh, these exceptional circumstances, we need to find ex exceptional responses. In the last three months, the landmarks that, that were ours have vanished as of all certainties. Allow me to introduce myself for those of you who are joining us for the first time. My name is Serge Rangoni, president of the ETC and director of the Theatre of Liège in Belgium. The pandemic has turned our, our planet upside down. The complete stopping of our activities overnight with health as the only watchword when it was thought that only the economy dominated the world. The total closure of borders, especially in Europe, where we had seen them disappear over the years. The abysmal increase in public deficits without any further restraint, thanks in particular to low interest rates, the highlighting of categories of workers in the front line among the lowest paid in all societies, and of course, with the cessation of all social activities, the awareness of the importance of the cultural and artistic sector throughout Europe. Here are some of the first observations we can make. However, the list is much longer. Some major speeches in favor of culture have been delivered in every country and within the European Union. Yet, can we really say what has been done? In Europe, after the Council of Ministers of Culture on 25 May last, words of comfort and solidarity with the cultural sector were uttered, but no major progress was made, no additional means were decided upon. It's the same in a great many countries, when the airlines were helped to the tune of billions and flights could resume in full, but with the mask on. In some countries, even, the leaders were able to take advantage of the crisis to break up the protest movements, then underway and curb a little more freedom of expression, and thus artistic freedom. All this in the embarrassed silence of Europe. I would like to thank very much Heidi, Hélène, Teresa, Josephine, Alice for the wonderful work because it was very difficult in this period. And especially a special thank to Iris Lofenberg and her team. Really, we hope to visit you next few months. Let's try in this couple of hours to find new way of being together. Let's open European theaters together again. I thank you very much to be here and to participate to this very special session of GA of ETC. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Serge. I have now received a letter from Maria Gabriel, the Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth from the European Commission, addressed to the members of the European Theatre Convention and who asked me to read this out to you. This is what I'm going to do now. Hold on. Dear members of the European Theatre Convention, dear friends, the title you have chosen, Connecting the Separated, Reopening European Theatres, reflects the re reality we have been living in over the past months. Physically separated, 
but connected thanks to our shared passions. And one of these is theater. I will start by saying that I miss the theaters very much. I miss the presence of performers, the life experience. I'm sure that this feeling is shared among all of us. This very peculiar period has made us realize that we need theater and culture more broadly, more than ever, because it is an important pillar for our cultural and li linguistic diversity. And because it allows an open space for society, for discourse and new ideas. Theater and the performing arts teach society about itself. Yet this function cannot be fulfilled at this moment. Events that we are witnessing around the world would benefit from the power of live performing arts to amplify messages of hope and solidarity. Many theaters in Europe, like other performing arts venues and artists, are suffering particularly strongly from the crisis. I want to express my awareness about the challenges you're facing. Second, my determination to use our instruments to mitigate the impact on your sector. And third, my vision for the future so that the sector can strive again and exercise its fundamental role for our society. Culture is not a luxury. It is an important social and economic factor to overcome any crisis. For this reason, if the health and safety measures are in place, theater should reopen because they contribute to the mental health and well being of our citizens and ultimately of our society. Over the past months, I have been working very closely with member states and stakeholders support the sector in concrete ways. We have done so, making sure that the horizontal measures put forward were available to all sectors. We have also applied targeted measures using the main instrument at our disposal, Creative Europe. One of the actions taken, important for the reopening of theaters, is the establishment of two platforms to exchange information with member states and the sector itself. This is important to allow for the international dimension of your work, allowing crews to play in different countries. In this regard, I wanted to inform you that through the platform Creatives Unite, we will organize a video conference with the cultural and creative sectors to discuss solutions and ideas put forward by the sector to learn from the crisis and build a stronger and more resilient sector. This will take place on 26th of June and I encourage you to participate. I also want to thank you for the resilience, dedication and innovation you have shown over these past months, pushing for new forms of collaboration via digital means. I'm fully aware that this cannot be a solution for the medium to long term. Digital means will never replace the unique experience of live performance. But I believe it is important for all cultural and creative sectors to engage in research and development, to step up innovation. Digital allows for new skills, new artistic formats, but also very importantly, to reach new and wider audiences in Europe. In this context, I wanted to inform you, I have proposed to launch this year a call under Erasmus Plus, earmarked for the cultural and creative sectors to improve digital skills and support the social inclusion role of culture in cooperation with the education, training, and youth institutions. This will certainly open concrete opportunities also for theaters. The focus will be on cross-border partnership and cooperation. Moreover, soon we will launch a 2.5 million euro call for the cross-border distribution of performing arts works both physical and digital. And finally, a mapping study on the ecosystem of theaters and the impact of the crisis is ongoing and should be ready for the European Theater Forum organized in November by the German presidency in cooperation with the European Commission. This forum will offer for the first time a European representation for the entire field of theater and performing arts. It will address the specific challenges for theater to circulate internationally and create bridges between the various geographical, linguistic, and structural borders to enhance 
international collaboration. Looking to the present, I wish you a very successful event. And I have to admit that I cannot wait to go back to the theater to see a play. Yours sincerely, Maria Gabriel. Well, those were the words from our Commissioner of Culture in Europe. And I think it's been very important that uh, she is giving such a strong message to us um, to move forward, to not let our arms just simply hang down, but uh, yes, to take the actions that we have to take to continue our work, even though it wasn't easy. And theaters were taken away from society over the last months a crucial experience for all of us. And now that we are slowly on the way to reappear, to retake our place in society, we realized nobody waits for you was something that uh, we all had to feel. And it led us also to ask now more than ever before, do the arts actually have a lobby in Europe? Connecting the separated and connecting artistic works with political and societal questions is what we intend to do. In collaboration with our member theaters, Schauspielhaus Graz and Cyprus Theatre Organization, we produce the next program part after an artistic intervention from Schauspielhaus Graz based on the play Nobody Waits for You by the Dutch playwright Lot Wegemans, Marina Malini who is Theatre Development Officer at Cyprus Theatre Organization and works also as journalist and TV moderator, will interview the cultural senator of Vienna, Ms. Veronika kaup -Hasler, asking her if the arts have a lobby in Europe. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Schauspielhaus Graz. My name is Carla Meda and I'm the head of dramaturgy here and I'm here on stage of our big house together with my colleagues Susanne Constance Weber, actress from our ensemble, Anja Wohlfahrt, who is an assistant director who's behind the camera today, and Jochen Strauch, um, who uh, is the director of a little play we're going to present to you now, uh, who is with us on Zoom because he's living in northern Germany. Actually, you should have all have been here right now at the ETC conference and um, yes, due to the internet, we are able to unite in other forms. And what we are gonna do right now is show you something highly improvised actually on stage um, because we have been rehearsing a play by Lord Wegemans, the Dutch uh, author, um, which might bring some basics to your discussion, which is to follow after this. Um, Lord Wegemans wrote a play, it's called Nobody Waits For You and it's a play with three monologues. It's about political responsibility of everybody. And the middle monologue is by a politician. Actually, the actress plays all three figures, ranging from an old woman, woman who's uh, over 80 years old, um, and the last figure is an actress. And the middle figure is a politician. And this part shows what it costs to be a politician. And we're now gonna present a very short uh, excerpt from this monologue, only a few minutes. And Susanne Constanze Weber will read this to you now in German. And you will see this is pre-recorded. We did this on Monday in our uh, empty theater. And um, you will find out when you see the subtitles. And now Susanne Constanze Weber. Ich weiß, es ist spät und Sie alle warten schon lange auf einen Bericht aus unserer Fraktion. Ich will Sie daher nicht länger warten lassen, nicht länger Spekulationen ausgeliefert sein lassen. Ich hatte eben eine Besprechung mit den Fraktionsvorsitzenden und den Fraktionsmitgliedern meiner Partei und ich habe Ihnen mitgeteilt, dass ich von der Parteispitze zurücktrete. Die Fakten sind bekannt. Wir haben bei den Wahlen eine schwere Niederlage erlitten und dafür fühle ich mich verantwortlich. Ich sage nicht, dass ich verantwortlich bin. Ich sage, dass ich mich verantwortlich fühle. Und wenn man sich für etwas verantwortlich fühlt, 
muss man damit Konsequenzen verbinden. Angesichts der Tatsache, dass ich Ihnen hier ein letztes Mal gegenüberstehe, möchte ich die Gelegenheit nutzen, Ihnen zu sagen, was ich auf dem Herzen habe. Als ich gerade angetreten war, ich war jung, ich war ehrgeizig, manche von Ihnen können sich daran vielleicht noch erinnern, wurde mir regelmäßig gesagt, ich solle nicht zu fanatisch sein, nicht zu sehr Recht bekommen wollen. Die Zeiten haben sich deutlich geändert und ich muss zugeben, ich habe Schwierigkeiten mit dieser sich verändernden Zeit. Ich finde mich darin nicht mehr zurecht. Ich komme aus einer Zeit, in der mir beigebracht wurde, zu diskutieren, den anderen ausreden zu lassen, auch wenn ich mit ihm oder ihr nicht einer Meinung war. Die Debatte war meine Arena. Darin fühlte ich mich zu Hause. Heutzutage erwartet man von mir, dass ich jedem ein Recht haben, hitzköpfig entgegenschleudere oder besser noch, einen Politiker aus einer anderen Partei an den Kopf werfe. Wir sollen unsere Rechthabereien aneinander abprallen lassen, als seien es Schlagbälle. Und Sie alle wissen, was passiert, wenn zwei Bälle gegeneinander prallen? Sie entfernen sich weiter voneinander. Man muss kein Wissenschaftler sein, um das zu verstehen. Ich denke eigentlich schon seit Jahren nur, es ist keine Zeit. Es ist zu viel zu tun, wir müssen weiter, wir müssen dies, wir müssen das. Wenn man wie verrückt durch die Gänge eilt, auf dem Weg zu einem Meeting, in der Tasche die nötigen Dokumente, mit den gelb markierten Sätzen deiner Mitarbeiter und den Notizzettel mit wichtigen Aussagen bloß nicht vergessen, Glauben Sie nicht, dass man dann das große Ganze noch sieht. Wen vertrete ich eigentlich? Vertrete ich überhaupt jemanden? Wie kann es sein, dass wir, damit meine ich die Politiker, wie kann es sein, dass wir so selbstsicher tun? Wir leben in einer Zeit von großer Veränderung. Das ist ein Klischee, das weiß ich. Aber es ist auch eine Tatsache. Die Entwicklung der Technologie, das Verschwinden von Handelsbeschränkungen, der weltweit zunehmende Konsum, die sozialen Medien, all das hat die Art, wie wir arbeiten und zusammenleben, grundlegend verändert. Es hat die Art, wie wir übereinander denken und sprechen, grundlegend verändert. Es hat den Einfluss nationaler Politik auf die Gesellschaft grundlegend verändert. Früher, ja, früher konnte ein Ministerpräsident in seiner Rede uns noch sagen, sie können in Ruhe zu Bett gehen. Wir waren geneigt, es zu glauben. Wir wollten es glauben. Welcher Politiker würde heutzutage noch einen solchen Satz wagen? Keiner. Denn niemand würde einem solchen Politiker glauben. Politik ist kein Ort der Wahrheit. Sie ist nicht objektiv. Sie ist ein Ort, an dem wir über alles sprechen müssen, dessen wir uns nicht sicher sind, an dem wir über Lösungen debattieren müssen. Well, it is not easy being a politician in times of change. As we uh, experienced while we were rehearsing, Nobody waits for you by Lord Wilkemans uh, via Zoom throughout Europe, from Brussels to Hamburg, from Graz to the Northern Sea. The Minister of Culture, Ulrike Lunacek, from Austria, stepped down because she had the feeling that she could not make any effect she was willing to do during to the Corona crisis. She held a speech which was quite similar to the one we now heard um, performed by Susanne Constanze Weber. And We were in a way deeply touched because we often are very, very, very easily upset about things which happen in politics and we, uh, we think about what can we do and that is the, the, the main motive of Lord Wegemann's play about self-responsibility and about uh, how to save our democracy. There is a special attraction to the play that it is uh, 
planned to be on site. So normally at this moment, we would perform it in, in some tryouts during the Dramatica Rinnen Festival in the City Hall of Graz. It will always be performed in places of uh, political power. For obvious reasons, we could not do that. So we made this digital uh, first period of rehearsals. And while we were rehearsing, something else happened in Germany. The, the Kanzlerin Angela Merkel was circulated to have said in a, in a meeting that she doesn't see any way to support the artists because uh, what would the European neighbors say? It was circulated that she was um, thinking about how would Spain and Italy react or, or France if she doesn't support Eurobonds, but she will support the artists. And a week later, she uh, went in a podcast in front of the cameras and said uh, how, how valuable the arts are for Germany. But in a certain way, the thought already originated in us and we were discussing in our rehearsals, does Europe need a lobby for the arts or is something like that already existing? Is there a political European lobby for the arts? And I hope maybe this little excerpt from our, from our text, from Lord Wegmann's text at our rehearsals, may give a little impulse for the now following discussion. Well, greetings from Cyprus and many thanks for this wonderful opportunity for communication with such a special guest. Uh, Executive City Councillor and State Minister for Cultural Affairs and Science of Vienna, Veronika kaup -Hassler. Many thanks for this wonderful opportunity. I'm happy you have me. Well, under the general title, Reopening European Theatres, uh, we enter a discussion entitled, Do the Arts Have a Lobby in Europe? And so firstly, allow me to ask you, having worked in the field of culture as a curator, a dramaturg, a cultural manager, entering this discussion today about politics and culture, where do you feel more inclined to place yourself? Would, you, um, would your perspective lean more towards wearing the hat of a politician or the hat of a cultural worker? Well, uh, theater has a lot to do with disguise. And I think uh, in this sense, I did put on a head of a politician, but whatever I am uh, was mainly um, focused on the arts. I felt always as a uh, warrior for the arts in all fields, being a practitioner, being a festival director, to open up spaces for artists uh, from all fields uh, possible, from theater, dance, uh, to uh, new media, to film, to visual arts. So I had the honor and a big pleasure to have a multidisciplinary festival for a long, long time. And I, I think I just, um, I'm still fighting the same fight, but with other means. And now it's the time really to make a change in politics, at least in the city of Vienna and wherever I can to gain more space for artists uh, and, and for my co former colleagues, for future colleagues and for the, the whole scene. So I feel I'm still totally active in the field, but I have more competence now to make something happen. And it seems like you are making something happen. And uh, in many levels, I, I read that you've managed uh, a 10% increase in, in funds, which is great. And it's not very usual as well. Do you feel there is enough dialogue between uh, people um, in your position and the national level so that the funds can keep coming? Well, um, as you might know, there was a, a big shift or many shifts in the Austrian government. Uh, we had this kind of Ibiza affair. We had a, we had a big move in the, in the government uh, to the right, I would say, center, right and right. Now we have a government um, of Green Party together with the major uh, big partner, which is the um, Popular Party which unfortunately in the last years uh, became more fundamental, more national, more shifting to the rights like anywhere else in Europe, besides Portugal. 
of course, uh, which is always a exception. But um, so it was hard to have this kind of contact. I do have it now. I, I gave uh, some weeks ago a very big interview in the Standard complaining that art was not an issue at all in the whole crisis, which finally, um, yeah, make a big noise and, and uh, put the art again on the plate of all parties, uh, which I'm very happy. It uh, unfortunately made uh, the re resignation of the cultural state secretary for arts, uh, who was just new to the field, first of all, and not dealing it right, even though she was from the Green Party, but she she was not capable to, to ask for uh, for enough money, so it was really uh, an embarrassment, the whole thing. And now art is again in the political agenda, and we have to use a very small window of opportunity to reinforce uh, the demands of arts. You have to think that, um, or to see that 0.6% uh, of the total budget uh, of Austria only is dedicated to arts and arts production, which is too little. In the city of Vienna, it's different. We have it now by 2.2% of the city budget is for uh, arts agen uh, agenda. And I think this has to be absolutely kept and we have to, um, we have to deal with very ardent issues which were ardent before. It was not only the crisis, the crisis brings it up of course, even more than ever, but uh, this kind of um, unfair payment in the arts, this was a problem even before. And so my initiative goes uh, uh, or has a lot to do with fair pay, with really reinforcing institutions so that they can pay the artists even in the crisis. So I told them, you get all the money, even if nothing is happening, because I want you to pay your collaborators, your co-workers, and the artists. And this made a big relief, of course, for the, for the scene. And course, plus, yeah, we decided also to, to give uh, um, money to our single artists um, who might have never had subsidies. So they have this kind of um, engagement of until 3,000 euros, they can apply for grants. So working grants, so they really can invest in their time, research, doing their own archive, making uh, projects from home, so that at least they have a little, uh, yeah, relief financially. I love this idea of fair play, and this is something that we've uh, tried to also enforce as Cyprus Theatre Organization for theatre specifically. Uh, we also have uh, given out the subsidies in order to uh, have theatres be able to pay their collaborators and uh, there's also schemes coming out to, to help um, both theatres be able to survive this and artists to be able to be productive and uh, to have uh, jobs. Um, how do you feel that um, well, you mentioned the 0.06% of the total budget in Austria, but it's not that far from the European budget, which is 0.08% uh, of the whole thing is allocated to to arts and to culture. Um, how but do you... 0.08%, it's not no, even 0.1%. So this is embarrassing. This is a shame. And I, we have to stand up against this kind of number. This is ridiculous. How do you feel lobbying will uh, uh, lobbying for the arts or lobbying for culture is um, doing at this time in Europe? Do you feel that it's um, impossible sometimes for ministers of culture to convince their own governments to convince Europe for the importance of this? First of all, I think we have too little a lobby in all of our countries, and especially also of, on the European level. I recall very well how the discussion went that we don't have even a commissioner for the arts. 
So we have to make much more lobbying work. And it's not about this kind of many, many networks we are all in, or we have been in, no? The ITM, the uh, European Theatre uh, Conventions, and there are so many networks on the colleague level. So it's not about that we are not talking to each other, that's not the point. But we are not uh, enough including politics into that. And we should use now the time really to uh, restructure our way of lobbying. We should really make a big pressure, a big pressure um, on the national level as well on the European level that art is an issue and culture is an issue. Um, we need it more than ever for our social health, for psychological health, for, for uh, the way democracy will shape. So, um, I, I have a, there is a big disbalance in this kind of colleague ne networks, which are many on all levels. They are very often focused on one art sphere, which is already problematic maybe, because for the lobbying, we should unite. We should, um, from my view, uh, we should really take the hands from opera to theater to visual arts to filmmakers really on a very very broad level uh, that a civic society is standing up and claiming the need for more funding in the arts it was an embarrassment before but the fights uh, which were fought were only on a very um, small level so each sector tried to gain as much money they could get in their in their field. So these particular interests um, are helping to make um, are helping uh, uh, ignorant politics to just give some presence fr from now and then to some parties, but to really go together and uh, regardless which sector of the arts that everyone stands up, this kind of raising up on a national level would help a lot. And if the pressure is enough, so that we, I'm, I'm also fighting on the on a national level for at least one percent of the budget uh, of the, on the national level that we have at least one percent of the budget. If that could be a claim also for euro, well, one percent would be. Super great, but I already would be happy if they raise it from 0 0.08 to at least 0.5 percent. This would make a big, big difference, and we need it also to develop the uh, the European project, which I still I'm in love still with the utopian momentum of it. But I, I um, I'm very critical about. Uh, the ongoing development since years uh, and this kind of uh, coming back of nationalism. But only if we have a strong impact on a national level, we can uh, push it also forward on, on the European level. And this has to be done very quickly right now. It was already um, a failure in the structure before, but now we have to raise our voices, I think. Well, do you feel that um, a European lobby for the arts would be assisted by, um, uh, for example, something like the European Theatre Forum, which is an advocacy forum under the German uh, EU pres presidency with arts organization uh, representation so that the real issues are effectively addressed um, by artistic input. So um, I agree with what you're saying that we need to cluster everything and so we have more power and force. But um, uh, I also feel that perhaps uh, addressing the artistic side of things in specific uh, might help. What do you think? No, uh, art is always in the center, of course. The art is in the center uh, and uh, you have to do both. The one thing is the political agenda. The one thing is that uh, organizations like the um, European Theatre Convention joins forces with like-wise organizations, similar organizations for other uh, art fields, 
so that these kind of super mega structures come together and join forces and put the pressure, have a strategy uh, in order to move things on, on the national and on the European level. So this has to be done. On the other hand, we really have to preserve um, the, the, the main focus should always be the artists at the end. They are the ones we care about, and not only the artists, also the audience. And we have to do anything we can do in order to spread out in our communities, not only that we make a program for the already convinced and they converted, but that we really try to get new audience uh, and make them experience how important art is for uh, for uh, creating a social space. The social tissue we have is mainly created by arts and uh, maybe the music industry or the, the music or uh, theater. And I think theater has a this uh, wonderful analog thing, which is can't be competed by uh, digitalization. We we all see the streamings of so many things, and we it is nice. Very often it's super nice, but I'm all, already tired uh, seeing people in their kitchen playing the guitars. So we, we need the being together. We need feeling each other. We need we need cinemas, for instance, also even in times of streaming and the availability of Netflix and all these kind of things. Uh, I, I think, and that's why I put really money into uh, art house cinema, uh, because I think the physical sharing of spaces is so important and we need the challenge also art is, art is doing. So that politics is not trying to use the art to solve problems they created and they are not able to, to solve. So this kind of uh, well-intentioned, um projects is all mostly an artistic problem for me so i think art has to be independent and autonomous in in uh, in, in the doing indeed and and uh, it, i love that you stress the fact uh, of gatherings and being together and per the, the performative aspect of it the live performance has to be strengthened and uh, and continued of course um Allow me to ask, you feel, you said that, um, you mentioned all these things that need to be done from the artist's point of view, from the cultural worker's point of view, from our point of view, trying to work with arts. And I would like to also address um, perhaps what needs to be done from a use point of view in terms of practical uh, things. Um, for example, we had the first EU theatre expert group, an initiative by the European Commission to which um, ETC's executive director Heidi, Giebel, uh, Heidi Wiley uh, was invited to consult in setting up. Um, such initiatives might, might uh, give us a voice and might work. Uh, what do you feel should be uh, addressed at European level from their side to ours? Yeah. I think, I think that politics has to uh, uh, recognize the importance of all art forms, uh, of, of the role of art in building up uh, societies, uh, also as a possible antagonist space, and they have really to put more money into already very precarious structures. We all know that our structures are more and more endangered. And if we only have this kind of neoliberal view of how many people do you reach, yeah? And uh, how many tickets you can sell, we have to see that this has some something to do with education. So this is uh, crossover thinking. It is education, it is social engagement, it is, also dealing with the most important issues of our times. Um, and art can do that. Art is always an avant-garde in, in doing so. But we need to have much more money put into that sector. This is always the first thing. That's why, why I also um, fought for it in the city of Vienna, because I realized how precarious the theater 
situation, even in such a rich city like Vienna, you know, how many people are really just surviving. And we need um, a strong politics which is fighting for that. It is dealing with the financial departments. It is, uh, it is uh, the, the help of, of uh, initiatives of all kinds. So institutions as well as the free scene, which is so important to, uh, to the whole cultural sector. And this is, let's say in, in my position, what I can do now is I try to, um, first of all, we are working together also in this precarious situation with uh, uh, people from the medical side, um, bring them together uh, with artists and theater makers and performance uh, artists in order that we can try to figure out in all those limitations we have right now, what is a secure way of doing the arts right now to make theater. And so we have guidelines, we develop guidelines which will be put online very soon. We also translated them in English. So uh, because we, we have the money uh, to really to make people work specifically on the needs of uh, performing arts. And so there are some fruitful guidelines everyone can d download uh, very soon. So we can provide that. But generally, I think we have a, a moment which is so dangerous as we have to keep up our voices in order that politics um, really puts more money into the, the, the whole field of arts. That's what we have to do. And we have to uh, fund also the free scene. I think that's important. I believe it's, it's funds and communication. And in these terms, we recently just opened um, uh, theater performances with our town in Cyprus Theater Organization in an open air theater. Um, and I do feel that communicating with theaters in Europe and sharing information on how to do that uh, is essential. Um, so uh, thanks for offering that information. Um, we are coming to a close and um, I would like to uh, ask you um, if you would like a last word for our network of European theatres watching this short interview on what you consider the key factor in reopening theatres after the pandemic. You mentioned the medical part but um, I would also like to, to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, I don't know uh, the situation in your country, but um, in Austria, there was a really filthy move by the government uh, because we had an epidemic law, law for epidemics, which would guarantee all the um, theaters and culture sector and, and other also economy um, to get money uh, for the loss in tickets and everything. This was guaranteed in this law. On the first day, they used this law to implement the state of emergency, more or less, but uh, they made a new law which extincted this paragraph. So the notion of paying to, to the uh, people. And I'm still fighting for this because this will be crucial in, in the survival of everyone here in, in that uh, artistic field. So I think um, we, have to, we have to try to guarantee the institutions that they have the possibility to su survive. Like in Swiss, in Swiss they said, we give, I don't, I don't know, it was like 286 million uh, franc uh, for uh, the first three months. So they, the, the artists there and the institutions are quite calm and they even prolong it as long as the crisis is going on. Because there will be a loss. If you want to be secure, you have to have a certain way of seating, yeah, like in a chess play, where you have one seat taken, the next, next seat next to you is free. So this is a, a way to uh, hopefully prevent that the corona virus is having a second wave. Yes. So, but this will, uh, this will be super not uh, economical for the theaters. And that's why the state has to guarantee 
they have to guarantee that this loss of income is compensated. And I think on the first level, the theater convention has to make sure that this is an issue for all of Europe, that com the compensation of the ticket loss is there, is provided by the European Commission. Thank you very much. Um, I do hope it, it happens and I do hope that theaters... <laughs> thank you very much for this conversation. Yeah, I thank you and continue be be subversive as much as you can and with, in a good mood and keep on fighting. I hope that we will be able to gain this uh, bet with audiences to come, uh, our time is up, to come back to the theater. And I do hope that uh, theaters will be supported so that they can go on. Yeah, we'll fight all on, everywhere we are, we fight for it. Thanks, thank you very much. Bye, thank you for the conversation. Well, thank you very much, Cultural Senator from Vienna and also Marina Maleni for having um, yeah, conducted this interview. Uh, we've also uh, recorded this um, already in the beginning of this week. I think the message from the Cultural Senator was very clear. We have to lobby for the arts. Uh, there is no other way. She showed us also the complexity of the issues. And I think one of the main criteria is to strengthen structures to strengthen the artists and to make our voices heard. Well, I have now the pleasure to introduce you to Marco Bratusch, who is uh, moderating the actual panel discussion of how to reopen European theatres. He is artistic director of the Slovenian National Theatre in Nova Govica. Welcome, Marco. Thank you, Heidi. Um, so, we have the corona crisis we are where we are but slowly things are settling down and we are getting ready to open the theaters some countries open the theaters already others are far away from it uh, but joining me today are uh, three people that are uh, actually um, very much involved in, in this whole process of uh, opening the theaters on European level. Uh, I would uh, like to present you Iris Laufenberg from uh, Schauspielhaus Graz. I kind of made it. Schauspielhaus Gra Graz, okay. Um, from Austria. Uh, hello, Iris. Hello. Um, and then uh, Dubrovka Vergoc, uh, general manager of the Croatian National Theater of Zagreb. Hello, Dubrovka. Hi, and uh, Norbert Rakowski from uh, Joko Opole from Poland. Hello, Norbert. Hello, everybody. Hi. So um, we are getting back uh, to making theater in these new circumstances, but how are we doing it? How, I mean, uh, the thing is there are health concerns financial concerns, um, restrictions, social distancing, uh, that all uh, really, really influence the work that we do. Uh, and uh, first and foremost, uh, there's the health concern that was raised during the um, Corona crisis, where uh, our respective governments more or less left us uh, to our own devices. I don't think that uh, there was a country in Europe that got really clear um, message from the government, from the health institutions on how to uh, work in theater. Uh, and that's why I would ask uh, Iris to kind of present us uh, with their uh, process. Uh, Iris was one of the first um, theaters that actually had a very good um, health plan, very good uh, plan on how to uh, possibly return to work when the, the crisis is over already in uh, early April or uh, late March. So uh, please, Iris, could you take us through the process? The sound? So can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Marco, for your introductory words. It's so nice to hear all of you and to see you again um, uh, now at the ETC panel discussion. Uh, 
if Corona didn't happen, we would have seen uh, us not only live now, but uh, I were hosting you uh, in the festival of current drama in Graz. Initially, I would like to summarize the situation we found ourselves in after the shock effects of lockdown had dispersed and the different challenges and obstacles we were faced with. First, we realized that we are being neglected by our politicians, all of us. And even worse, we were not seen as relevant for society. We realized then that nobody knows better than we ourselves was needed to work at the theater. So we created, as you mentioned, our own measures by comparing our different theater develop departments with the relevant departments of society to reopening theater soon. By the way, we shared uh, the short catalog uh, with the ETC to share it also with you, the members of the ETC. But one important difference between Austria and other countries is that, that here the health, the health guidelines are not as restricted as maybe in other countries. And for example, uh, the Germany, Germany has the problem uh, as well that there are uh, different federal um, states. And so um, all the states have different rules. We have this in Austria a little bit too, because in Vienna, uh, the situation is a little bit different as in uh, the Styria, because in the Styria, the incidence rate is uh, not so high. So, um, so now we have the, to considerate between insurance and self-responsibility. For example, in Germany, it's a, the situation is in this case totally different. The, repu the reputable, reputable Bochum Theater opened yesterday, uh, maybe you have heard it, uh, with Elias Canetti's play, The Days Are Numbered, in an auditorium for 800 people with 50 sold tickets for masked audience. And on stage, there is a distance, um, the rule is a distance between three to six meters. It's a really strange situation. We are here in this situation. In Austria, we are speaking now about less than a meter distance everywhere. And with this distance, we are hopefully going to expect more or less a normal audience situation without mask in autumn. Apart from the fear of having a second wave, we have a lot of challenges ahead of us, I think. Now is the time to consider what we should keep and what we want to change. But first of all, the problem is all of us, we have to bring our audience back by evoking their trust and having attractive program. We ended, we all ended abruptly in March with an audience, and in this case here, with more than 90%. So the financial question is also a, a huge, a, really a huge challenge also here in Graz. Even so, I am confident audience will come back. We have to confront them with more than they are going to expect. Even we need to sell tickets for our budget. We must not run after our spectators. We theater makers have now, really now, this is the time to think about our resources relating to the waste of time, to the waste of energy, the waste of materials, the waste of human capacity and the waste in general. I think we must ask ourselves and as artists, theater makers and as the role, uh, as role models in society, what we loved or what unnecessary habits are not practicable anymore nowadays. Um, maybe uh, to be as well in case uh, relevant, maybe as a role model, model in this case. Um, in conclusion, with all our flow of reopening, restart um, with this energy, theater energy, let us not forget, forget, forget that we must change things. Um, now I would like to hand back to uh, Marco and maybe we can talk about our 
concrete practice of change during the discussion furthermore, if you want to. Thank you. Yes, this is, uh, thank you. Uh, this is absolutely a theme that we will open uh, a bit later on for uh, all the panelists, uh, but I would like to give the word now to Dubroka. Um, Dubra uh, Dubroko is one of uh, the first theaters to open. Croatia was one of the first countries to actually uh, go back uh, to theater. Um, and uh, we also started in Slovenia, but the, for, for the first week, we, the actors were wearing... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how, how, uh, how did it go in Croatia? How, what are the financial implications? Uh, what are the practicalities of going back for uh, for the biggest uh, Croatian's uh, theater that also includes opera, uh, ballet, and uh, drama, Dubrovka. Hello to everybody from Sunny Zagreb. Um, just to say, in the last three months, we survived two big crises. One crisis was uh, coronavirus. Another crisis is earthquake, which actually we had in Zagreb of 22, 22nd of March. So. We are here. I uh, just want to ask, is it possible to, to show the short video of reopening Croatian National Theatre at the moment? Actually, you saw the the video, which was uh, screaming 26th of May in Croatian National Theater, and it was a day of reopening the theater. But just to tell you the short history of the last three months, so we closed the theater on 12th of March, as uh, and the same period as many European theaters, as other European theaters for the few weeks we were completely confused and we didn't get any any guidelines for anybody no politician no any kind of european uh, politicians or any suggestion so we were uh, quite lost and um, then we started to do it uh, online uh, um, presentation of our uh, theater performances, I mean the opera, drama and ballet. We did it with the main uh, Croatian daily newspapers on their YouTube platform. And in one and a half months, we got a uh, half million of uh, visitors, what is quite a lot for Croatia. Uh, then we start to planning the, uh, some programs in the case if we will be uh, have a possibility to do in live. And first of all, we got a suggestion from the politician and from the minister that we are supposed to close the season 20, uh, 1920 because there will no be any possibilities to continue. At the same time, we were planning to make some small program from outside on the time when we, we will be allowed to do it. So uh, in the beginning, at the end of April, we, we get a small short concert we are planning to do uh, in Zagreb. And it was uh, quite idea to be the gift for the uh, citizen of Zagreb after the earthquake, because the situation, especially in the center of Zagreb was quite uh, uh, depressed. And uh, you can imagine if you have an earthquake and uh, uh, more than thousand houses was really damaged during the, the earthquake in the center of Zagreb. At the same time, we have a lockdown of the same city of the whole city, and it was a quite desperate situation. So the 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 politician actually the the health um, uh, part of um, of our government, which were allow 
people to do something in this period allow us to make a short concert of 20 minutes. But the idea of this concert was to, to be uh, like in the place where people can could listen or watching us through the balcony or through the windows. So 4th of May, we were allowed to do it. And this project, we call it Croatian National Theater in your neighborhood. So we went to the different neighborhood of Zagreb and got this small, small, uh, I mean, short concert. It actually means that two singers was uh, singing and one pianist uh, uh, was coming through this. And at the beginning of 4th of uh, May, when we opened it, it was allowed to be five people together on the street, but uh, getting better from time to time. So we got a 10 concert around the whole Zagreb. It was a big success. And we get a really connection with the audience for the first time. It was very emotion. I mean, in the both side and the beginning, people were, were crying. I mean, our singers and audience. And even like it was not allowed, there were a lot of old people who was coming and our old audience and really wanted to be with the with, in the touch with the artist and to 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 get a possibility to be really uh, like an audience in a in a real theater so uh, at uh, 11 of may we were allowed to do the rehearsal what was actually we didn't know like uh, two days ago we didn't know that we could do it so we continued to do it uh, rehearsal for uh, for drama, opera, and ballet, and then really like from uh, 18 to 19 of uh, May, we were allowed to to start to continue with the season. So we decided to take all the measures, and as you could see in the audio, in the video, we really uh, uh, make um, for one week. We will really try to make anything uh, safe and follow with the rules we got for the health department. And um, so we are 26 reopened with the concert you saw. And uh, at the moment in the theater, it's a post, the theater uh, has 709 seats. And at the moment we are supposed to have 250 seats. But at the same time, if you have a, a opera program, it's uh, less because there should be four meters between the uh, singers or musician and the audience. So it could be different between uh, uh, ballet, drama, and um, opera. At the same time, as we didn't know that we will continue the season, we, we plan for a, a program for outside the theater. And we now, during a parallel to program, program in the theater and the program outside the theater. Outside the program, it's like a concert, like the summer night in the Croatian National Theater. It's a concert, it's some ballet, performances and uh, it's also some uh, drama interactive uh, uh, performances or more like happening but uh, this uh, creation national the, the summer night of creation national theaters are completely for free uh, so the loss of the creation national theater of the moment it's really uh, quite big because uh, for the two months we didn't play so there is no box office money there is no uh, any kind of income and we at the moment we didn't know uh, and we don't know or we will not know for sure for some time what will happen with the money we got from the Ministry of City regarding our program for 2020. So there is no news and um, there is no any guidelines uh, what we're supposed to do with the programming. So this is not uh, only our situation but the uh, the whole European theater are faced with the situation of loss of money and not really know what will happen. Uh, and if government will give the money uh, for the loss of, for example, the box office loss or for the programming. Uh, in Croatia, the government give the money for the independence artists uh, who are not who are not able to, to play, to perform in these three months. But also I think it's really important to stress on the institution because the institution is quite fragile, you know, during this time. And still, we don't know what will be our future regarding the second, third or fourth wave, or we don't have any guidelines how we will work in the September. We hope it will be normally, but it's just a hope. 
So I think uh, that it should be really uh, very important to, to, to know or to get more information about our nearest future, but also as a network to, to, to give some really platform to see uh, is the future will be normal or probably not, and in which way we also could be flexible regarding the money and regarding the program and what kind of new initiative and new idea and we can get, I mean, generally. Thank you, Bubroka. Um, yes, this raises important uh, questions on, on actually how to do the second part of the year, uh, because uh, the loss of uh, income, the loss of uh, also the timing, the loss of time, because uh, I, I, mean, I personally needed to postpone one project and then postpone another one, uh, cancel one of the performances already. Uh, we have no idea what money we will have for the autumn, because uh, if they are not uh, willing, we need to co-finance our own performances with our own money, which means that uh, this money is now gone. What will this mean? There will be rebalancing of the state budget in July. So uh, we are pretty much, um, everybody is up in the air and we will probably need to resort to some parts of a, a quick guerrilla tactic to uh, make it, to, to keep the system running. Um, also, what we did in Slovenia was that we kind of uh, um, kept the co-productions. So the, the, the co-productions, uh, the performances that more cities can profit from. So basically that uh, we do one performance and then play it in Koper Maribor and uh, Nova Gorica, for instance. Uh, but how does this work in uh, international uh, level? Uh, Norbert, uh, this is the queue. Now, um, the borders are still more or less uh, closed. Uh, countries are still uh, um, trying to uh, preserve, uh, preserve the closed borders to kind of um, uh, for, for the benefit of tourism to keep the guests at home. Um, what do we do with the international um, cooperation, Norbert? Your thoughts? Hello from Poland, from Opola, north of Poland. Uh, at the beginning, I have to say, uh, sadly, uh, it also became clear with pandemic uh, that we are extremely far in social needs, uh, but also more than extremely far in uh, government priorities. It's really sad. Uh, so we got no any uh, rules, uh, not pandemic law, we got just recommendation to open theatres and it depends up to every artistic director from the theatres. But when we are talking about challenges of keeping the international activities uh, running production traveling exchanges, uh, hmm, uh, of course nobody knows, uh, but it's crucial though uh, to invent new ways uh, for international collaborations, including traveling ideas and exchange possibilities. It's impossible to force the future, but it's very likely uh, we'll be left without uh, festivals in the form as we know, of course. And I was thinking, of course, everybody are thinking what we can propose instead. Probably, probably, of course, uh, long-term collaborations as co-production uh, are more likely and we can bring artistic for example we can bring artistic and uh, production teams uh, with all needs health regime and quarantine we can present more than one piece for example in festivals it means uh, we have to maybe it gives a unique chance for uh, very precise and responsible uh, international theater and programming. Uh, and also uh, it gives a unique chance for very, uh, uh, I, I think it's, it's also have to expect funding cuts, of course, and lack of interest in international theaters, maybe, of course, because nobody knows. But we, uh, we are, uh, of course, waiting and we sustain in international processes. Also launching new ones, including dance project uh, related to the coronavirus pandemic. 
uh, aftermath. It calls Dance Macabre uh, 2021, made by or programming by uh, Renata Piotrowska, a Polish choreographer. Also, we planning to uh, to make uh, our last co-production. Uh, I'm nowhere with uh, Madrid. I hope it will be in 22. Uh, we plan uh, Chinese and Japanese present Chinese and Japanese theater companies. Uh, also, we preparing uh, showcase in December in JK of Opera Theater. Uh, of course, our only plans right now we are not open. We are pretty lucky because we are we have a re renovations from beginning of March and we want to open the theater uh, in the end of September. So we can say we are a bit lucky in this moment because we we planned this renovation constructions from two years. So everybody knew that we don't play right now. It's it's our, our particular example. But in Poland, some theaters start to work normally. I mean, in ordinary way, not ordinary with the temperatures, with some regime. Uh, but uh, we also. Uh, starting new co-productions, but in Poland, not in uh, international, two co-productions with Katowice and Legnica. Uh, from 16 of June, we start rehearsals on the stage, King Lear, uh, directed by Anna Augustinovich, with 15 women and one, one man. Uh, it means a lot of people on the stage. So we need to figure out our own procedures to be safe and be safe with the actors. So of course, two meters on rehearsals, mask, uh, temperature measure. And it's also for two weeks in the end of uh, June. Then uh, we restart the rehearsals from uh, half of uh, August. Also two next co-production with another festivals. Uh, as I said at, at the beginning, nobody knows what happened because uh, because we don't have a pandemic law. So as I said, uh, just recommendation and we don't know what happened. Uh, also, we are planning a big festival in uh, November. It's a Polish classic drama when we reopen theater. And right now I can say, I invite you for a showcase in December from, we got a whole plan and I can send you, of course, even a, a invitation, but let's see what happened. Uh, so what, what is uh, really, uh, I don't know, funny, but uh, it's a really bad word, but it's interesting. Uh, Germany is a model example when it comes to support for artists during pandemic for Polish artists, like, because we don't have uh, any support. I mean, just very, very small. So um, that's it, uh, maybe, um, maybe when we re really, when we really think about programming uh, international co-productions, we need to think about new rules. And maybe it's a, a kind of topic for discussion, our discussion, because uh, I'm not uh, right now an expert of it. Thank you, Norbert. Uh, let me just remind everybody that uh, at the end of this session, we also have a Q&A, so question and answer uh, segment. Uh, so please send uh, your questions uh, in the chat. You have a, there's a chat button. And uh, so, um, yeah, come up with uh, things to talk about. Um, my next question is for all panelists. Um, and uh, it goes like this. So Corona is here. Uh, what do we do now? What do we do in terms of uh, artistic vision do we change uh, the plays we are playing do we change the the how we produce things um, do you know maybe that i mean how, how to approach this uh, corona uh, thing of course uh, people were coming to me and say oh yeah we should do a comedy on the corona uh, this should be so funny everybody would want to see it and i was like ah i'm not sure this is like only one joke in there and uh, you might repeat it three times, but I'm not really sure if this is going to work. But um, the, the, this, with social distancing, with all these measures, with uh, a second wave looming uh, uh, above our heads, um, 
are there things that you are thinking of how to adopt your program to kind of fit into this new uh, lockdown era? It is. Uh, I thought Dubrovka, you want to say something? Okay. Uh, I, I think uh, we don't uh, need uh, on stage Corona topics because we have the society things, uh, they are burning and we uh, see the things as uh, Veronica mentioned before, that were before that we um, maybe haven't seen or not enough, uh, like uh, through a burning glass. And so, for example, uh, the environment questions and all the things, uh, um, you can uh, choose place or uh, collect people to say something about that or to, to, to bring it into artists. Uh, and it's for me, uh, it was always our uh, topic or our goal. But now I think we see uh, things clearer and we, and we see that we are the same uh, environment gangsters in the arts or in the cultural uh, companies as uh, other people are as well, uh, because uh, we're drinking on plastic, maybe not, but, but we have this uh, uh, canteens, stuff canteens with all these meats and all the things. And, but, and we have to think about it and we have to change, I, as I mentioned before, as role models. And also uh, on, the, on the same, um, on, also uh, because we are in a way companies, yeah? And we are acting and we are traveling like, uh, yeah, uh, like we have no um, idea what's going on uh, in the world. So that's uh, the thing I think is very important. Dubrovka. Uh, I just want to say that uh, we face now about our problem and we could see that our sector cultural sector, but especially the performing arts sector are most damaged than other sectors during this corona crisis. And in this case, as we are all talking today about reopening the theater and some theater in Europe is not open. Some theater will not be open like UK theater. I got a message from my English friends that the UK theater will be open in the, maybe in the summer 21. I think that we have to rethink about the position of the theater in the time in the society. And in this case, we also, I think that we need to rethink as Iris said about the, our repertoire because it couldn't be the same as it like one year ago or when we plan 2020 or this season. And so rethink about uh, programming, about the repertoire, rethink about the financial, I mean, support and how we will, actually survive uh, in financial way, but also the rethink of possibility of international collaboration. As, as Norbert say, it's a big question mark, what will be about the mobility? And we know that uh, like one of the uh, main issue of European Commission was uh, uh, and European Union was the mobility, but this mobility now is stopped. So we need to think what kind of mobility we can use it in the nearest future. And in this case, what kind of collaboration we need to set up. Okay. Uh, I think that there is another big or even biggest question, who is coming back? Who will risk the comeback and why? So uh, maybe uh, that will be the reasons reprogramming something, you know, I, I mean that, uh, how to approach them with the programming, how to meet their expectation, the people who will come back, uh, of course, is the, is the risk for them, uh, who is responsible for, for them's health, you know, so this is, uh, there is a lot of questions. Yes. More questions than, than answers. Absolutely. Um, so uh, the thing is now we have some questions. Um, and uh, so uh, can you talk a, a, a bit about solutions for rehearsals? What is the impact of lockdown in your artistic program for next season? So uh, we touched a bit on, uh, we started in Slovenia, we started rehearsals, as I said, with uh, masks and, and visors like this. Uh, after three days, this was lifted. So um, 
And uh, then there was a um, period of uh, confusion regarding do we need to wear masks or not. Uh, there was like, a, a, a first the, the instruction was you only need mask if you're getting closer to one and a half meter. Uh, then it was like, you don't need it. Uh, then they, they opened schools. In schools there, uh, first it was only 10 kids together in each uh, separate um, bench, but then after a while, they every, they put everybody together. So in Slovenia, we kind of said, okay, so basically we are, uh, the, the actors are like a group of pupils in, in school, which means that uh, they are together all the time. The same people are together. They're going back to their families. So uh, situation is pretty analog here. So we kind of said, okay, nobody knows what the instructions are, but let's let's simplify that of course I, I checked with the actors if anybody has any reservations about that and of course they were really really eager to get back to work and re resume work normally because um, at some point these uh, measures will be dropped and uh, to kind of go on using that and, and putting it into the the play like there are two families one has visors and the other has masks it's a joke but it, it's after this is irrelevant, it's not uh, a joke anymore. So we kind of um, did that. Um, and uh, there's also a question, what is the reaction of audience? We are also opened up for, for the audience in Nova Gorica and uh, um, people are really eager to get back. They, uh, it was a dance performance uh, uh, that usually doesn't get a lot, uh, a lot of attention. But we uh, we sold out. We actually were a bit over capacity because some people from the theater also came, so we needed to to fill the seats that were marked with X's. Uh, but the thing is, uh, and the reaction from the people is, they really miss theater. So, uh, th but of course, Slovenia was not hit as hard as, as some other countries might be. So, um, Dubroka, maybe uh, you, how, how did you restart the um, in Croatia the the rehearsals. Are you asking for a rehearsal or for a performances? No, for rehearsals. Yes, we started the rehearsal before the, the started with the performances and we started the rehearsal like in a quite normal way because of our measure, there was just a measure for uh, uh, singers and for musicians to be uh, two meters in a rehearsing space, but for um, uh, actors and even for ballet dancers, there is no measure. So they could, could I mean, have a rehearsal in a old or a so-called normal way. I just want to say one thing about the audience, um, because there is a question also about how we deal with the audience. We didn't have any problem with the audience from the moment we opened the theater. People were not afraid at all. Even like we have, as you said, two seats together and then uh, boxes together, but people who didn't know each other, they wanted to sit to each other. And they, they didn't use the mask during the, the performance. Of course, Croatia had and still have a great situation regarding the virus. So we are almost um, Corona free zone. Not, not really, I mean, we have uh, two cases yesterday, but not a lot of cases for a few days. So, but the uh, people are really craving to be in the theater again. And we, I don't afraid that uh, people will not fill the uh, houses when they were allowed to really fulfill the houses. Great news. Yes, uh, there's a next question. Um, how do we make sure our borders remain open and lobby for clear guidelines for travel and give artists the same exceptions than workers from the other sectors so international touring can happen in the autumn? This is a, a very good question. Uh, I'm pretty pessimistic about this one uh, because we tried to, to get answers from our governments regarding the work at home. And... Um, you know, going over borders uh, is implies a lot of diplomacy. Uh, for instance, Slovenia and Austria had a, um, like a diplomatic falling out. Uh, Austria opened all borders except to Slovenia. Uh, and uh, it was from Slovenian standpoint, it was, ah, you're just trying to protect your tourism uh, and you don't want people to come to Slovenia or Croatia to the seaside. 
and um, at some point they kind of open the borders. Uh, so there's a lot more than just uh, to that, than just, um, uh, I do think they actually understand what we want, but they, they're not giving it to us. And of course they, they are not even willing to, to speak to us. So uh, basically we probably will need to do something that we did like it is uh, with the health protocols, we will need to do it ourselves. So we will need to find loopholes on, on how to continue doing that. But of course, a lot of that is, is dependent on uh, whether the second wave comes and what this means uh, in terms of uh, do we, so once there's a second wave, probably theaters will be the first to close again. So basically to have a backup plan with, safe, uh, with social distancing probably will not help at that point. But uh, of course, um, uh, do any of our other panelists have a, a thought on, on this, how to lobby our way into uh, international touring? Norbert, maybe. I don't know. I don't know what I have to say. <laughs> so it's quite a difficult question. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, this is, this is the, the, uh, the situations we are now in. And um, I mean, the thing is, uh, we are running uh, Creative Europe, uh, project for teenagers and we just had a meeting yesterday we thought we would just cancel it but then we said okay no let's let's try to, to meet so we, we we are trying to get back on track even with our international activities even though uh, at this point it, it seems like really shaky um but there's always concern of of governments just changing uh, on a whim um the rules for instance i had a, um, a costume designer from montenegro uh, that I needed to kind of finish the premiere we're doing now. And um, she got all the papers right. She got everything. Uh, and there was no, there was supposed to be no quarantine between the two countries. But when she landed, uh, they put her in quarantine for, for 14 days. So, uh, so then we just needed to quarantine her in the, at the workshop. Uh, for costumes, because th there was no other way to finish. But um, the thing is, uh, it's really unclear and, and we're really improvising a lot. As you said, uh, the theaters and, and the movies are rated internationally six to 10 in terms of risk. And gyms are only eight to 10. So we are really high risk. Um, and probably if something happens, so we will be again closed. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the, the problem is, uh, from the way I see it, a lot of there's uh, the audience is quite old uh, for most of the theaters. So this, of course, uh, kind of elevates the risk. We have another question, uh, or no? It's. Uh, I just, just want to say one thing that there is a two two words. I think it's really important for this period. One word is to be patient. Another word is to be flexible. So I think that things change, and we don't know. I mean, well, the creation experience that is changed during the night. They said, okay, it's allowed to play or not allowed. So I think that we we cannot really know what will happen as, as we agree all about this. But also, it could happen that things change. So I think that we really need to be very flexible and and to have a plan A and plan B and plan C. And maybe we should think about uh, completely new rules uh, and regulations in the theaters, like uh, to think about it right now, you know, for the future. In Poland, we need to change it from 40 years and nobody did. There is a, uh, another question. Uh, so uh, uh -huh, there's a comment. Uh, Creative Europe has been understanding in allowing current project to spill over in uh, two, uh, 2021, according to our experience. Marina Maleni said, um, yeah, they, they have been understanding. And of course, uh, they were willing to accept uh, like online uh, things instead of live meetings. But the thing is, my personal opinion is that we, we, we must not uh, succumb to fear. We, we need to go on um, really, um, uh, because the theater, the point of theater is, is live audience in the same room with, with the performance and the, the energy that exchanges there. This is like the, the specialty of our, our sector. So um, I think we need to fight for that. And of course, be prepared for plan B, but of course uh, this should be our aim to, 
to also to get back to international uh, touring as soon as possible. Um, Claudia Bilchior is asking, uh, due to the lockdown of borders, are you changing your artistic program into a more local one? Um, so, yes, I... Of course. I mean, the thing is, I, I needed to postpone a, a project with a Romanian director because she, we, she couldn't get here in time. So this was one, one thing. And of course, uh, one of the projects that was uh, canceled was project with an um, Italian uh, director. So this was uh, because at that point, we couldn't be sure if they, they could make it. Uh, so um, this is one of the, the thing. We'll, uh, uh, how, how about the others? Did, did you change your international plans for the season, Iris? Uh, yes, of course, because there's no international festival now here. <laughs> um, but uh, I think it's uh, worse to do uh, or to have theatre for a local audience. It's, it's very fantastic. Um, and I think we have to, to do this international work uh, maybe uh, first in a different way. And maybe there are dig digital visions we can come together in the next year to get, come together. For example, we have a lot of uh, drama festivals of cur current drama. It's a profile of our house. And so we were invited to three different festivals, to Heidelberg, to Mülheim, to Berlin, and we can't go there. But it's a pity, but also maybe it's a chance to, to, get, to come together all these authors because they are the, the, the issue, the, the, uh, the playwrights. And maybe we can come together in a digital way, um, um, maybe not only in Europe, in an international way, because we know each other, not personal, but we know each other and uh, we can focus some uh, topics uh, in a digital uh, festival. It's not a sub substitute for uh, to be a live uh, festival, but we have so uh, many festivals for current drama, and maybe there's uh, there are some wishes inside, um, and we we don't see now. And uh, but of course, Marco, I agree. We theater is live, of course, and and I love my local. Uh, audience and I want to prove now is there more diversity in society here in Graz and in Styria. So that's uh, also our um, goals. We, we didn't uh, really, we, we did, but uh, not as a, the main focus. And so there are also changes in this disaster. Dubroka. The international uh, actually we didn't change a lot i mean we postponed because um, as you know the croatian croatia is a has a presidency of eu for this first six months in the corona time so we postponed many many international guest performances either the performances who are supposed to come european uh, performances are supposed to come to croatia or either the other way around that we have to go to the different European uh, destination. So we just postponed for the next part of the season. And as I said, uh, we didn't cancel anything. Also in a opera, we, we started to rehearse uh, uh, with the uh, European, uh, I mean, with the French uh, director and he will come in the beginning of September to work with us and the whole team. So we hope that it will be possible. So we are continue to to work as just to postpone everything to the to the next part of the year. Okay, there, there's another question about uh, the support of freelancers. Uh, this uh, um, this issue is really really probably differs from country to country. Uh, on what to do with freelancers. Uh, in Slovenia, they got the support for the month of uh, April and May. They got uh, like UTD, uh, so um, uh, with the, some, some money like 700 euros per month. Uh, but of course, the government uh, uh, canceled the pandemic not to pay also for June. So everybody is now on their own. And of course, this is why uh, also one of the reasons that I, I kind of, we decided to, to restart the season as soon as possible because a lot of freelancers are working for uh, bigger theaters. Uh, right now I'm doing a project with eight dancers. And of course, if, if they're working, I can give them some advances. So, um, but of course, uh, 
it really depends from country to country because in uh, Eastern countries, we have a lot of uh, theaters with ensembles, which means a lot of actors are actually employed and there's a smaller number of freelancers. Whereas in the Western countries, more or less uh, the majority of actors are freelancers. And of course the support there needs to be much stronger for that period of time. Um, so I hope this answers the, the question about- the I can say, I can just say uh, that uh, we got a few programs for uh, freelancers. JK Opola Theater also invite many people just to work because we got as usually a repertoire theater a team. But we start with the new program Modelatornia Online, which was specially for freelancers. And right now we offer for autumn and the next seasons, small groups like a freelancers uh, groups just uh, offer the stages uh, one a month or what, two once, twice a month uh, pay on our stages for free. So this is kind of support freelancers because our team is safe, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is now, uh, actually now is the time to be uh, for solidarity yeah. uh, in our sector, because the thing, the way I look at it is, is like an ecosystem. There are free, freelancers that are feeding off the bigger theaters that need the cultural institutions uh, that are buying our shows to show all, all around the country. So this is all kind of uh, connected and of course, uh, because the thing was, there was an idea in Slovenia, ah, let's just take the, theater, the money from the theaters and put it in the freelancers. But then, I mean, it helps in, in the first wave, but the second wave if, without uh, us having money, we don't have the money to pay them. So it's again uh, a hit on the freelancers. So, I mean, it's a complex, it's a complex uh, system. And that's why I think this system is only as good as, as, as long as it's running. And of course, uh, the questions whether we should change the system are, are right on point because this system only works with 95% efficiency. So uh, if we drop be below 95%, the things start to collapse. And of course uh, now with, I mean, our theater lost more than 50% of income because at this point, because of this stoppage, uh, because we couldn't sell shows and we sell most of the shows uh, during this period, because in, in the autumn we usually have the premieres and we have a lot of uh, shows at home and then we go on the road and, and these shows on the road are, are actually bringing more money than shows at home. So this is a, a very, very delicate situation. But um, yeah, uh, we have another um, question. Do you think the pandemic will affect the view on artistic freedom in Europe? Is this a question in your countries and uh, in your artistic networks? If I, if I may start, the thing is, uh, in, in, in Slovenia, it really depends on the kind of government that we have. Uh, when the government is right wing, they're really trying to, uh, um, let's say, uh, to influence the public opinion against the arts. Um, and they're really not a good uh, um, partner to try to, to get some, something done. Uh, whereas the left-wing governments are willing to talk, but they don't really do much uh, as well. So basically, the, but uh, at least they're not um, they're not uh, going into uh, artistic freedom um, things. So uh, the question here is, what we will do? Uh, probably, I mean, my question is, uh, how it will affect the finances? How will uh, the finances affect artistic uh, visions? The thing is, of course us as in, uh, cultural institutions, we will probably need to make more money. So does that mean that we sacrifice some of our artistic um, projects and do more uh, projects for, for the general public? Uh, this is uh, basically a, a concern. I, I haven't changed anything in this regard. So I haven't done it yet, but uh, at some point, if it becomes a necessity, probably I will need to look into that to keep the, the system running. But um, yes, please. Uh, I, I, I have to say that for last three years, we didn't make uh, any comedy, uh, even uh, Boulevard of ours. And right now uh, we trying to figure out somehow, probably in the beginning of 21, uh, a piece who will support us, you know, uh, support the artistic way of the theater. <laughs> 
So it means so it kind of, we, we need to find a kind of balance of it. It is Dubroka. I I don't think that I I mean now we could see only the financial consequences of the crisis, and I think that soon we will see other consequences of the of the crisis. But I, I don't, from our experience, it doesn't mean that uh, we need to ma make very popular theater to get a more audience. I think uh, our experience, uh, because uh, a few years ago, when, when we came, the new team came to the National Theater, it was empty. And we, we, we are doing an artistically more interesting program to get people uh, back to the theater and we see we succeeded so I'm still believe in this that uh, it doesn't mean that you need to go uh, below the level artistic level to get um, to get the people back in the theater I think that you need to just to make a theater as a safe place and and that's also with uh, some artistic challenge get them in the theater back Is, you're okay. Okay. Uh, there's a, another question here, uh, which uh, is um, about um, uh, the. When did you announce the season? How how are you going about announcing the new seasons uh, uh, for season ticket holders? This is not applicable to all, all theaters, but those who have the season tickets, like for instance Nova Gorica, we usually uh, um, announce our program around. Uh, mid-May for the next season and now we push this back to August so uh, because right now I still have no idea what I will uh, do I need to uh, actually find another piece uh, of the puzzle to actually complete the season uh, and we cannot do that uh, until we get the confirmation from the government about the, our funding for the rest of the year so this is kind of a, a bit of complicated situation so we will uh, we will after the so 17th of uh, August, we will go out with the program and we will start with season ticket uh, subscriptions. Dubroka? Yes, uh, we were work thinking a lot about this and we were working a lot about this because we are big theater and we have a lot of subscriber. So we decided to postpone because usually we come in June, we started to the audience starting subscribers starting to, to buy the tickets for the uh, next season abonnement. So we postpone it uh, to, the, to the beginning of September, but we do the whole plan. I mean, the, the repertoire for the subscriber, uh, we got a program book for them, we got the flyer. So we did everything as it will be normal. And then we can make it like a, a flexible situation if it will not be no normal. Also, because we have some, um, uh, some, some performance uh, uh, was not uh, able for subscriber to see for this season. So we, we make a voucher for them so they can buy the new uh, abonnement with uh, less uh, with this voucher so that's make a balance for the new one so we are pretending that everything will be okay we so with the full audience we will start it to do it at the beginning of september it is yeah but in graz it's similar um, to that we have uh, decided that we uh, we planned the, the, the big stage uh, with, because uh, this is uh, relevant for the subscribers, and so we uh, there is a program, a magazine uh, with, the, with the program for the huge stage on uh, the end of June, and the subscribers know they won't they will be back on their seats. Uh, Hopefully, this is the situation, and uh, we will give them the tickets uh, in the end of August. But uh, we want them to be sure that all the things are going on in autumn. And uh, the other stages, um, we were um, offering uh, the program in uh, uh, October for the other for the experimental uh, stages, uh, and we have a lot of plans, but we are not sure. If we had to have enough uh, money to do all this uh, program because we need, of course, the the tickets, uh, the tickets of the youth stage, big stage, and um, but uh, we uh, have planned now 
uh, very carefully with 50% uh, of the audience. It's only to be, uh, to be sure that uh, we can uh, go on and go on. And I'm really, um, yes, I think we can. It's only to, yeah, to go on steps in the, in the next season. Okay, thank you. Norbert, do you have a uh, I have to be sure. I have to be sure we open theater. I mean, uh, it, everything depends up to their reconstruction. So if we finish at the beginning of uh, September, we open in the end of September. And uh, uh, there will be no problem because everybody are waiting for new opening. So <laughs> this, is, this is cool. Uh, but we have a kind of programs and we start selling tickets uh, when we will be sure we open uh, theater. There was one last question about uh, how to uh, increase the audience, not to get back only the ones who are already convinced the theater is cool, but how to approach new audiences and uh, how to approach uh, schools. Um, the schools are uh, for Novagorica are kind of uh, um, important partner, but the thing is we usually have a meeting with them around this time, but uh, this year we just said let's postpone it to August because nobody is sure on, on whether the health, I mean, what, what the regulations will be. Uh, so at this point, uh, the teachers in Slovenia are a bit reluctant to, to go to schools because the problem is uh, taking the responsibility. Nobody wants to take responsibility. So the government doesn't give any uh, rules on how to behave because they don't, don't want to be responsible. Uh, of course, theaters, we do what we do because we needed to, to keep the system going. But again, we wouldn't like to have the responsibility for epidemic on our hands. Um, so probably time will tell uh, about uh, the schools. Uh, does anyone else have a... No, it's the same exactly in Poland. It's, it's absolutely the same. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Iris Dubrovka. Thank you, Norbert, uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this session. Um, I hope we answered some of the questions, uh, addressed some of uh, the things regarding reopening the theaters. I'm giving my, the word back to the ETC staff and um, I hope to see you soon live. Yes. <laughs>
and to work also internationally as uh, the Board can say. Thanks a lot and have a good lunch. Unfortunately, not all together, but <laughs> thanks a lot. Goodbye. Yes, thank you, Serge. And before you're all off to lunch or going back into your theaters uh, to continue the preparations, let me just tell you also there are lots of uh, other resources also of what's going on right now um, about how to open theaters, uh, surveys, um, also indications with clear figures and numbers of the implications on our website. Uh, so I really invite you to take a look also to um, yeah, find additional resources also for your own work um, on our website. Let me thank very much our collaboration partners uh, from Schauspielhaus Graz, from Cyprus Theatre Organization, also already from last night, Belarus Free Theatre, who started uh, to discuss the revolutionary aspect also of theatre to still to be continued as part of the current debates. Um, to come up with the future of uh, our sector to survive this pandemic. I want to say thank you to our various many speakers from all over Europe who uh, have taken the time this morning yeah, to share your insights with us. Thank you, Marco, also for this wonderful moderation of yours. I want to say thanks to our members and guests who tuned in, uh, who took the time to yeah, join our conversations and took part also in uh, the debate afterwards. I want to say thank you to our live stream viewers for watching and use the last um, moments to announce the upcoming events as part of this uh, conference. This afternoon at two o'clock, we continue with a digital theater webinar offered by our colleagues from the uh, Academy of Digital Theater in Dortmund entitled Deep Space Meets Theater. It's at two o'clock here online. Tomorrow, our members and invited guests are um, hopefully joining the uh, General Assembly of ETC. And the next ETC coffee break, the moment for international networking, where we also have time to uh, explore further the topics from today, but also address actual international collaboration and followed by this next week, we have a collaboration with Deutsche Theater as part of the Rada Ost Festival on the 21st of June. Members from ETC from uh, Poland, uh, Czech uh, Republic, Belarus Free Theater, Hungary join us in a discussion on Sunday about news from the East. We will have our European Theater Academy from the 1st to the 3rd of July and join the Théâtre de Luxembourg uh, during their talent um, lab, also from the 1st of the 3rd of July with online discussions about the future of Europe. And last but not least, let me invite you to uh, put down your agendas in November from the 11th to the 13th, the European Theatre Forum will take place, what Commissioner Gabriel announced and I'm pleased to announce that ETC is organizing this event together with many other organizations from European Performing and Theater. So please join us then, as well as to the next ETC conference from the 26th to the 29th of November, hopefully in Hungary. Well, and if you want to find out more about ETC or maybe how your theater can join us, just have a look on our website or contact us. We will be happy to speak to you, get in touch. And now, thank you, everyone. And um, yeah, have a nice day. Goodbye.